Okay. Um, can I welcome men members to the 29th meeting in 2017 of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee? Can I welcome Lynn McMinn and Ailsa? How do you pronounce your surname? Hainer. Hainer. Right. Officials from Disclosure Scotland and the Scottish Government to the meeting. Um, agenda item one is decision on taking business in private. As proposed, the committee takes items four, five, and six in private. And those items are the contents of a report to the Social Security M Committee on the Social Security Scotland Bill, the contents of a report to the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee on the Island Scotland Bill, and consideration of the evidence heard on the Draft Police Act 1997 and the Protection of Vulnerable Groups Scotland Act 2007, Remedial Order 2018. Does the committee agree to take these items in private? Probably. <laughs> So, move on to agenda item two, which is the Draft Police Act 1997 and the Protection of Vulnerable Groups Scotland Act 2007, Remedial Order 2018. <coughs> the proposed draft order is brought forward in response to the judgment of the Court of Session in the case of P versus Scottish Ministers, which found that certain provisions of the Protection of Vulnerable Groups Scotland Act 2007 were incompatible with Article 8 of the EHCR. It's brought forward under the general procedure for remedial orders under section 13 of the Convention Rights Compliance Scotland Act 2001. That section requires that a proposed draft of the order is laid before Parliament for 60 days for comments before a finalised draft is laid before the Parliament at a later date. So once again, uh, we welcome Lynn McMinn, Policy Manager from Disclosure Scotland, and Ailsa Haney, Senior Principal Legal Officer from the Scottish Government to the committee this morning. Um, so do, do you have any opening comments or should we just move just straight to on. questions? Yes. Just go in for, in for questions then. Okay. Um, so can you explain why the Scottish Government brought forward this proposed draft order and how does it respond to the Court of Sessions judgment in the case, which I've previously mentioned, of P versus the Scottish Ministers. Who wants to take that? Um, the Scottish Ministers have brought forward the order uh, in response, as you said, to the case of um, P against the Scottish Ministers. In that case, um, the Court found that the automatic disclosure of the petitioner's conviction uh, was incompatible with his uh, Article 8 rights. Um, therefore, Scottish ministers are unable to act incompatibly and need to bring forward amending legislation to, uh, in relation to the disclosure system. Um, we consider that the, the order does address the issues raised uh, by the court in P against Scottish ministers. Um, the court in that case was concerned at the automatic disclosure of a conviction that was um, fairly old and which had also been obtained when the person was a child when he was age, uh, aged 14. Therefore, um, this remedial order seeks to address those particular issues by um, providing for a right of review to uh, a person with a disclosure which contains a, a, an offence listed on Schedule 8A to the Police Act 1997. And that's a, the list of more serious offences. And the, the, the refinement that we're making will provide a right of appeal to the right to make an application to the to a Sheriff Court to have a conviction removed if that Schedule 8A conviction is more than 15 years old, if the person was 18 at the age of conviction, or uh, after seven and a half years if the person was aged under 18 at the age of conviction. So we consider that addresses the, the two particular issues raised in, in the P against Scottish Ministers, the age of the person at the time of conviction and the, the length of time since the conviction was obtained. Okay. Lynn? Nothing, nothing to add. add. No. Nope. Okay. So, can you explain why you're responding to the Court of Sessions judgment 
by way of the reme remedial order process and yep. why you've chosen to follow the general procedure? Um, well, in relation to um, the choice of a remedial order, we felt that that was the most appropriate way of responding to a court judgment which identifies a specific defect. The Convention Rights Compliance Act 2001 gives Scottish ministers powers to remedy primary legislation in circumstances such as these. Um, and we are, the court gave us nine months in which to fix the defect. Therefore, it seemed to us that this was the most appropriate means of, of, of bringing forward legislation and a, allowing us to respond within that time scale, but using the general procedure so that there was an opportunity for a full consultation before any amendments to the, legis to the primary legislation come into force. Okay. Can I put something to you that we received from the uh, Faculty of Advocates? Um, they, they, they say, they, I'll just read it to you, the proposed changes partially address the issues of EHCR compatibility. However, the opportunity to seek an independent review of disclosure of serious offences on the basis of time elapsed since the date of conviction will not necessarily guarantee that the, the disclosure system is in accordance with the law and proportionate in every case. Well, what would your response be to that? We have noted the Faculty of Advocates' comments and we will uh, review them along with other comments that we get in from the consultation. Um, we believe that the, the provisions do um, Meet, uh, meet the judgment that uh, Lord Pentland gave for P. We believe that, that as, and so far as we can say, that they do meet um, ECHR compliance. We believe that the offences um, that we aim to disclose are so serious that they should be disclosed for 15 years or seven and a half years. Uh, we are trying to balance safeguarding, which is Disclosure Scotland's fundamental um, position, uh, job within Scottish Government, which, so we're trying to balance uh, safeguarding. These are individuals applying to work with the most vulnerable in society, along with um, the individual's right to private life, and we believe that we've got that balance with these pro pro proposed provisions. Okay, so, so you haven't actually, there's, there's no detailed response to that point. You, you'll say you'll come back to them. Yes, we will. Well, I, mean, I think, I mean, our view would be that we have addressed the issues raised by by the court in P against Scottish ministers, and it, we consider that that the, the 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 provisions in the order will make the system ECHR compatible. And ultimately, of course, it's only a court that would then be able to determine whether or not the the amended provisions are compatible. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Okay respond as Scottish ministers will respond to all consultation there'll be a consultation report um, published at the end of the review of the responses and um, sometime early December okay well you mentioned the consultation um, so what what sort of responses have you have you received so far and what issues have been raised about the compatibility um, to issue to date we've had 11 responses to the consultation four have been from organizations 11 have been from individuals um, three of the responses have raised concerns about the lack of um, information being disclosed on a certificate the seven of the respondents overwhelmingly um, support the decision uh, to allow an appeal mechanism for individuals with AA offences. Okay, okay. Uh, move on to Stuart. Thank you. Hey, good morning. Um, <clears throat> the, the period of 15 years I was chosen uh, in this uh, 2015 uh, remedial order. Can you explain uh, why this period was actually chosen and also uh, why has the, the time period been chosen in the proposed draft order? And also, were there any different time periods considered? We considered uh, 15 years and seven, seven and a half years um, were derived under the context of the current Rehabilitation Offenders 
um, periods for disclosure. We also looked at CHS and how long uh, criminal conviction history is kept on the criminal history system. Uh, we believe that those were proportionate um, in that uh, the offences that we're disclosing and then uh, are very relevant to regulated work and working with vulnerable adults and children and we felt that the time periods were appropriate. Um, we did uh, look at uh, other uh, time frames but we believe that these were the most appropriate um, time frames due to the nature of the work and the offences that we'd be looking at disclose for these time periods. Under the 2015 order, there's a number of offences, that, um, minor offences that don't d get disclosed uh, as soon as they become spent. So these are just the more serious offences that are uh, related to regulated work. Have you got anything else to add, Elsa? Um, I, I mean, the, the, the periods of 15 years and seven and a half years um, reflect to some extent the, the periods uh, which relate to schedule B offences. So Schedule B in the Police Act 1997 lists serious offences, but less serious than the Schedule 8A offences. And um, at the time that those provisions were introduced, uh, we, we chose periods of 15 years and seven and a half years, after which the disclosure of those less serious convictions would, would, would not take place, so-called protected convictions. Uh, so the provision in relation, the new provision in relation to the Schedule 8A e offences, it does to, to tie in to some extent with the with the provisions that relate to Schedule B, 8B, and um, it, it is to do with the Rehabilitation of Offenders Act periods after which convictions become spent, um, and the the long it's the longest period. Of rehabilitation under the Rehabilitation of Offenders Act 1974 for someone aged over 18 is 10 years. Therefore, if we chose a period of less than 15 or less than 10 years, then the conviction wouldn't actually be spent before the person was able to be appealing. Therefore, we feel that with the maximum 10-year um, rehabilitation period, 15 years um, is then appropriate for. The, 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 the right to, to make an application for removal of, of, of the conviction. Yeah, certainly since the, the 2015 remedial order, um, have there been any concerns raised uh, regarding the proportionality of the 15-year uh, time period? No, no. I mean, we've had no uh, uh, issues raised with us at all around that period. There's been no, nothing. And certainly regarding the the, the issue of hard cases. Um, does the Scottish Government consider that, that hard cases uh, fall very close to the line uh, and, uh, and will they be adequately addressed by any proposed changes going forward? <coughs> and hard cases by that, I mean, I'll explain that just in terms of uh, up to the 15 years, it, it might be someone, uh, maybe someone uh, missed about 14 and a half years uh, down the line, or if it's seven and a half, maybe. Uh, about seven years, so it's just getting under close to uh, the line, but just not managed to kind of go over it at that point. You mean in relation to the Schedule Eight A convictions, yeah. like somebody who then has no no right to make an application for yes. another six months, basically? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, mean, I think the difficulty is that wherever we draw the line, mm -hmm. there will be a hard case, potential hard case that falls on the other side of that line. The courts have been quite clear, though, that government is entitled to. To, to draw bright lines, and uh, the, 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 the courts have also made it clear that it's not necessary to provide a right of appeal in every individual dis uh, case. Therefore, we've, we feel that the line, we have drawn the right line in the right place here. Um, potentially, there may be hard cases that fall with, on either side of it, but if we draw the line at 14 years, then you'll have the same issue. Mm -hmm for somebody who's got a conviction that's 13 and a half years old, so... Um. And I, I think it's probably fair to say that uh, obviously the line has to be drawn at some point, and, um, and there will be uh, individuals who will just fall just a bit short, but I think at the same time, I think that there has to be a level of consistency. Uh, I think this is where um, each individual uh, person, each individual case, uh, it would have to be considered on its own merits, but I mean, also that could then open up uh, other challenges going forward, I would imagine. 
Yes, potentially. And I mean, and the courts have quite clearly stated that is not they don't consider it necessary in the disclosure system that uh, that there is an individual right of appeal for every single person who applies for a disclosure, and therefore, you know, they, we we feel that the, the, the you know the lines can be drawn somewhere. The courts have have said that that, that, that it's appropriate to to have a a, a a filtering system. And if, when we're looking at, I think you have to also bear in mind, we're looking at the Schedule 8A offences, which are a list of serious offences. They, they were um, chosen quite specifically at the time of the 2015 remedial order as being offences where they involved serious harm to, 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 to victims, where there had been a breach, where there's a breach of trust, where there's violence, where um, there's such reckless conduct uh, that, that, uh, that, that would cause um, potential harm or, or actual harm. And therefore, all of the offences in that list are, are offences which someone uh, employing somebody to work in regulated work with children or protected adults or to work in other professions or... Uh, uh, situations where enhanced, um, where higher level disclosure is, is available, those types of uh, that type of behaviour is highly relevant uh, for, for those disclosures, uh, and therefore, um, wh where the, where the, where the conviction is not particularly old, then then disclosure uh, would be appropriate to, to to protect the rights of, of vulnerable groups. Okay, thank you. Okay, <coughs> David. Thank you, Convener. Um, I have a couple of questions on the level of sentence and relevance of conviction. The proposal draft order provides for an appeal to a sheriff against the disclosure of Schedule AA offences based on the period of time which has passed since conviction. Did the Scottish Government consider also providing for the right to appeal based on the level of a sentence imposed and on the relevance of a conviction to employment being sought? We did consider whether there should be other, any other criteria uh, included for, for, for the availability of the application to the, to the sheriff, and we concluded that the, it was sufficient to simply provide uh, for the application on the basis of the, the length of time since conviction and the age at the time of conviction. Um, again, that comes back to the, 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 that, list, that list in Schedule 8E does contain serious offences. And therefore, if somebody receives a conviction for one of those offences, we consider that it is a, that, that the, an employer or other organisation seeking a higher level disclosure should have that information available to them. It doesn't necessarily preclude employment, or, uh, but the employer should have that information available to them, given the nature of the, of the conviction. And therefore, we, ch we decided that it wasn't necessary to make any specific provision regarding the length of the sentence or, uh, and, and in relation to the relevance of, of the offence to the disclosure, because of those offences were all specifically chosen as offences which are serious and involving certain types of behaviour, then we consider they are all relevant when somebody's seeking a higher level disclosure. Um, would you consider a provision would be beneficial in helping to ensure the proportionality of a disclosure scheme? Sorry, could you say that? I didn't catch the question. Um, would you consider that prov the provision would be beneficial in helping to ensure the proportionality of a disclosure scheme? What type of provision were you meaning? Um, what we're t talking about, putting in um, the oh, so, so further criteria yes, to... Yes, five, yes. At, I mean, at, we're certainly uh, happy t to consider those kind of comments, but... At, when we, when we uh, laid the draft order, we were of the view that it, it wasn't necessary to make any additional provisions. And um, one of the reasons for that is we did note in uh, the judgment in um, P against Scottish ministers, and uh, one part of his judgment, Lord Pentland, discussed possible solutions to designing a, a, a disclosure system which would be more, more nuanced. Uh, and he, say, he said, and I quote from the judgment, there are other possible ways in which some greater element of flexibility might be built into the scheme as it applies to the type of conviction which the present case involved, which was obviously a, a Schedule 8A conviction. And if, for example, provision could be made for a cut-off date for automatic disclosure of convictions such as the petitioners after the expiry of an appropriate length of time following the conviction 
or there could be a derogation from automatic disclosure where the offence was committed during the offender's childhood and a suitable period has elapsed since then. So he described those as options for a solution and that is what the remedial order provides for. The cut-off point where, the, the, where uh, after 15 years or seven and a half years, depending on the age, uh, allowing the, the person to, to, go, to go to the sheriff for a review of whether the information in the disclosure is still relevant. Thank you. So we, we think that you know we've addressed what Lord I mean the Lord Pentland says in his judgment, and you know he set that out as possible solutions without setting out any further criteria. Obviously, those remarks are obiter in his his judgment, but we, we have to take some guidance from from what he set out in his judgment. Okay. Alison Harris. Okay, good morning. good morning. The previous DPLR committee noted a number of concerns about the sheriff review procedure as it applied to Schedule 8B convictions. The committee's concerns related firstly to the perceived need for practical assistance for individuals in understanding and negotiating the sheriff review procedure, and secondly, to whether the sheriff review procedure has the potential to alert a prospective employer to the existence of a spent conviction information. Have any particular issues been identified with the existing system for appeals to the Sheriff? We've had nothing specific raised to us about any concerns or issues around the appeal, appeal mechanism. The numbers have been so small since the appeal mm -hmm. mechanism came in, it's quite difficult to draw any concrete conclusions. We are, however, as part of the PVG review, in the process of contacting individuals who have intimated that they're going to review to a Sheriff to get some feedback on the the procedure okay. and the process, and to see if there's any way that we can improve it or uh, make it easier. Okay. Um, just to, you say the numbers were small. How many? We've had to date 24 appeals since okay. 2015 on eight B offences. Right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that answer. Could I now move on to the transitional provisions and ask you, the proposed draft order contains transition, transitional provision dealing with the transition from the existing regime to the proposed new regime. How is it envisaged that these provisions will work and what considerations inform them? Do you mean operational trans transitional position, uh, transitional uh, arrangements? Uh, basically, operationally, we will um, continue uh, processing the applications up until the midnight on February 16th under the old regime and then any uh, cases that are in the system and any new cases from uh, the February 17th will be processed under the new regime um, and we have um, internal procedures in place to deal with that. Jump back to appeals before you move on to your next question Alison. Um, so, the way the system works is somebody somebody applies for a job um, that requires uh, disclosure. The potential employer uh, makes an application for disclosure. Um, a form comes to the person who's applied for the job, and they then appeal. Right. That will cause a delay then in the job application. Uh, Therefore, alert, uh, potentially alerting an employer to a, a potential problem. Has, has it been? Have you heard any? We've not had yeah. any issues raised as about that. If an applicant states that they're not going to appeal, their certificate is released, and in 90% of cases, we're meeting our 14-day SLA and uh, employer certificates being released to them. Um, with regards to um, individuals, that's a discussion they'll have to have with their employers. Um, some of them may have already discussed their conviction history with their employer. Some of them may even have shown their, their own certificate to the employer, but um, we can't make any comment on that because we've, we've had no uh, feedback to say that there's any concerns really in relating to that. There's also a number of reasons why certificates, uh, an applicant's certificate might be um, delayed. It might be that they've filled it in incorrectly. It's not necessarily that they've just intimated that they want to make an appeal. And you're saying anyway there's not much of a delay in any case? Well, it depends. Um, how look, If they take the appeal forward, uh, then uh, it's down to Sheriff's um, yeah. timescales. They can ask for an expedited um, hearing under the, the summary procedure. Um, but if they 
with regards to the processing, if they ask for their certificate to be released and they're not going to appeal, there's no delay. Okay. The, there, may, there could be other reasons why a certificate is delayed if the, in terms of um, enhanced disclosures or PVG scheme records, the police are asked for each one of those whether there's um, what they call other relevant information and if there was to be other relevant information, sometimes that takes quite a long time to be processed, so that would be another reason. So it's not... It wouldn't necessarily be uh, clear to an employer, well, it won't be clear to an employer why a disclosure might not be received quite quickly. There would be a number, a number of other reasons. Um, but once they go to the appeal, the, appeal is, the, the appeals are taking many months to deal with. So the employers, I mean, it, it's difficult to know what, we have had, as Lynn says, we've had no feedback, so we don't know what employers think in those situations. But there, we have had quite a substantial number of notifications of people going to appeal, uh, and um, people don't actually appeal, and then so presumably their job application is at an end. We don't know, so we've, but we just don't have the information. So we have no idea whether the the fact that somebody has appealed and it's taken months to deal with whether that's caused them to lose out on a job. We don't know that. We don't There's no way of finding out. Well, that is something that we're trying to do as part of the PVG review. We're now con we've started conversation with these individuals to try and get feedback, find out if they're still in regulated work or what the impact of the appeal has been on them. Okay, Alison. Okay, thank you. That that <coughs> helped expanding in that point. Going back to what I was asking about the transitional provisions, though, was I correct in saying that you were saying up to midnight and one date you'll be using yeah. one regime and then the following yeah. morning another regime? Yeah. And that's obviously deemed the better way forward. Do you? Well, it seems we, quite harsh. You know, a line to be drawn. So do you just stop at five o'clock processing that bundle and then start that bundle under a new regime the following morning? Well, we process um, 24 hours a day in Disclosure Scotland. So, um, but yeah, we believe that that's the best way forward. It also reduces the amount of uh, backlog um, and we can just... Um, ensure that certificates are dealt with quickly and move through the process quickly. Um, if we just have a cut-off date, it's easier for us and it's easier for the applicants. Okay. Happy with that, Alison? Oh, I'm not sure. I don't know where I would stand <laughs> if I was an applicant. Maybe hold it back a day or two. I just... It's quite, you know... I think the difficulty is there always has to be a cut-off point for the, for the new provisions coming mm. into force. So, again, wherever we draw that cut-off point... And if we hold it back, then we're going to delay the process of that applicant application. And if they're waiting for that certificate for a job prospect, then we, we felt this was the best way to ensure there wasn't a delay in the production of certificates, which in individuals are requiring for, to, you know, for jobs. There are around a thousand applications a day. Yeah. Dealt with well, every no, day. I, I so appreciate that, you have a volume, but to so me that it sounds for a bit more... Whenever, you know, if we were to hold it back for several days... Then you know, that's several thousand people. Yeah, no, no, I understand, waiting. but you know, I think from individuals, it really boils down to, from what I'm hearing, the luck of the draw as to whether you're going to be processed under the newer, old regime. Then come quarter to midnight on that evening, if you're 24 hours production. Yeah. Yeah. Basically. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay. Right, Monica. Uh, thanks, Kevin. Good morning. The committee understands that the Scottish Government proposes to lay the required draft affirmative instrument, which makes connected changes to the requirement for self-disclosure of past offences under the Rehabilitation of Offenders legislation uh, to come before the Parliament following the end of the initial 60-day scrutiny period for the, propose, for the proposed draft order. In order to assist the committee in scrutinising how the newly amended higher disclosure regime, including self-disclosure, is intended to work overall. Would the Scottish Government be willing to share with the committee a proposed draft of this instrument during the initial 60-day scrutiny period for the proposed draft order? Um, that wasn't something that we had considered at present. Um, uh, I, would, I think we would have to take that back and, and consider further whether we were in a position to, to provide a draft during the the, the 60 days. I mean, our, our intention is that uh, when when this the 
final remedi draft remedial order is laid, that it would be laid at the same time as the draft uh, affirmative order dealing with the changes to the rehabilitation of offenders legislation, so that the Parliament at that point would be able to consider both pieces of legislation together and how they operate. But we can we can consider whether it's possible to to provide a draft. Anyway. Thank you. Yeah, I'm sure the committee will appreciate your offer to to take that away for consideration. Um, in the statement of reasons supplied with the proposed draft order, you refer to a wider review of the higher level disclosure system. Are you able to explain more about this review and how it might impact on the changes being made by the proposed draft order? The review is taking place currently. Um, the Scottish Minister has made a commitment to review the PVG scheme and the, higher, um, and the disclosure regime in Scotland in general. That's been terms of reference were published in February this year and it's been ongoing. Um, it's been a collaborative approach with uh, a large number of stakeholders have been involved. <clears throat> any outcomes of that review and any changes to legislation are, uh, if that's required are unlikely to happen uh, any time soon. Um, any amendments that we're making to the legislation under this remedial order, the previous one, it will also be looked at. Like I said previously, we're looking at you know, as part of the review whether or not the appeal uh, mechanism in place is uh, working if it's appropriate. Um, it's unlikely um, that, like, as I said, that there'll be any major changes to the disclosure regime uh, anytime soon. So the impact immediately of um, the review on, on this remedial order will, is slim or non-existent. Okay. And just for clarity, when you say it's unlikely, um, can you just explain why that is? Because we're still engaging with stakeholders to determine uh, what amendments need to be made to the current system, if any. Uh, we're trying to work with, as we said, it's a wholly collaborative approach, so we've been engaging. We've engaged with over 300 uh, individuals and organisations involved in um, the disclosure regime in Scotland. That includes individual members of the scheme as well as organisations that use PVG. Um, and there's a, an awful lot of work. We'd still have to go to formal consultation on any proposed changes that might come out of that review. Um, so it's just basically the length of time it takes to uh, go through the consultation process. And then obviously if there was any changes to the legislation from the review, we'd have to go through a bill process, which also takes time. So this um, is this informal consultation at the moment, and yeah, so this is, is a pre-consultation right. consultation of like we were just trying to figure out exactly what we might want to change, what issues, if there is any issues with the current system before we go to formal consultation. Okay, and how long will that kind of dialogue with stakeholders? How long will that run for? Um, it's been running since January this year. Uh, we would hope to be going to formal consultation uh, next year, spring of next year. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Any members have any follow-up questions? No? Okay. Um, uh, thank you very much for your time this morning, and I'll suspend the meeting briefly. Agenda item three, instruments subject to negative procedure. Uh, so we've got Council Tax Reduction Scotland Amendment number two, regulations 2017 SSI 2017 326. These regulations make further amendments to the Council Tax Reduction Scotland regulations 2012 and the Council Tax Reduction State Pension Credit Scotland Regulations 2012, which are the principal regulations. 
It's suggested by our legal advisors that the regulations raise a devolution issue for the same reasons as were discussed by the committee previously when considering the Council Tax uh, Reduction Scotland Regulations 2012 SSI 2012-303 and the Council Tax Reduction State Pension Credit Scotland Regulations 2012 SSI 2012-319 and subsequent amending instruments. That is to say that the regulations raise a devolution issue as they may relate to matters which are reserved by Section F1 of Part 2 of Schedule 5 to the Scotland Act 1998 in relation to social security schemes. It's recognised, however, that the Scottish Government takes a contrary view. Since September last year, a new Exception 10 to the Social Security Reservation has given the Scottish Parliament powers to create new benefit schemes in areas of devolved responsibility where the requirements of the exception are satisfied, including that the new scheme must be funded by the Scottish Consolidated Fund. In relation to the Council Tax Reduction Scotland Amendment Regulations 2017 SSI 2017-41, considered by the Committee on March the 7th this year, the Committee suggested to the Scottish Government that framing a new discrete scheme could avoid the Committee's concern. Were that scheme to comply with the requirements of Exception 10, which I referred to earlier. The committee also highlighted that a new discrete scheme would have a further benefit of accessibility to readers if consolidated regulations could be produced. The principal regulations are well in need of consolidation, as this is the twelfth amending instrument. The Cabinet Secretary for Finance and the Constitution wrote to the committee on October the 4th, in which he undertook to be in touch in relation to the potential to consolidate the principal regulations and to update the committee on that issue in the next few months. Do members have any comments? No. no. Okay. So, some questions. Firstly, does the committee wish to draw the regulations to the attention of the Parliament on reporting ground F on the basis that they raise devolution issue. Uh, convener? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, no, I, uh, obviously it's been a, a well uh, documented and uh, well issue in this uh, committee and uh, I, would, uh, I, I disagree certainly with, uh, with the question that's been posed uh, by yourself and uh, I think that uh, there isn't a, a devolution issue. Okay. Um, I wish to advise members that intend to vote um, in accordance with the advice that these issues do raise a devolution um, issue. In the event of a tied vote, I'll use my casting vote in the same manner. Does anyone else have anything to say? Okay. So the proposition is that the committee considers that the regulations... Sorry, Monica, I missed you. Sorry, convener, um, I had my hands up, but I know you, you didn't notice. Um, it was just to, to add, um, you know, my, my agreement with the position that you're taking. For me, um, the legal advice uh, is, is important and, um, you know, we have to make sure that the, the legislation is competent because it does, in the end of the day, affect, um, um, you know, we want people to be able to claim what they're entitled to and we don't want there to be any challenge to this. So um, I'm concerned that this legal advice hasn't been um, fully um, taken on board by the government. Okay, so we'll move to the proposition, um, and that is that the committee considers that the regulations raise a devolution issue and should be drawn to the attention of the Parliament on that basis. Um, I would say, are we agreed? We're obviously not all agreed, so we'll move to a vote. So those in favour of, of that proposition, if you could raise your hands. Okay, and those against. Okay. So that was uh, three to two in favour um, of that proposition. Okay. So secondly, does the committee uh, propose to seek an update on the consolidation of the principal regulations when the Minister for Parliamentary Business attends the committee in December 
to respond to issues raised in the committee's annual report. Yeah, okay. So, Council Tax Reduction Scotland Amendment Number Two, Amendment Regulations 2017 SSI 2017-357. This instrument, instrument makes a specific amendment uh, of the Council Tax Reduction uh, Scotland Amendment Number Two, Regulations 2017, to fully implement the policy intention underlying those regulations. Uh, SSI 2017-326, which we've just considered, uh, includes amendments to the Council Tax Reduction Scotland Regulations 2012 to enable income from the new bereavement support payment to be disregarded when calculating an applicant's level of Council Tax Reduction. SSI 2017-326 was laid on October the 6th. The Scottish Government has explained that shortly after that date, it was identified that the regulations did not fulfil the policy intention that income from bereavement support payments should be wholly ignored in the Council Tax Reduction Scheme when calculating an applicant's income. So unless SSI 2017-326 was changed, it would have the effect that only £20 of someone's bereavement support payment was disregarded rather than the full payment. SSI 2017-357, now be considered, addresses that issue. This aims to ensure that the original policy intention is met so that income from such support payments is disregarded in full for those of working age for 52 weeks from the date of the first payment. Our legal advisers make the same suggestion as for SSI 2017-326 by which I mean that they consider that the regulations raise a devolution issue as they may relate to matters which are reserved by Section F1 of Part 2 of Schedule 5 to the Scotland Act 1998. And again, it's recognised that the Scottish Government takes a contrary view. So, does the Committee wish to draw the regulations to the attention of the Parliament on Reporting Ground F? That is, that the, reg uh, the regulations raise a devolution issue for the same reasons that the committee has previously considered. Stuart? Uh, no, once again, uh, I'll, I'll disagree with that recommendation. Okay. So, again, the, the proposition is that the committee considers that the regulations yeah. raise a devolution issue and should be drawn to the attention of the Parliament on that basis. Um, so all those in favour of that, raise your hands. Okay, and those against? Okay, so that's um, carried three to two. Right. Okay. Um, furthermore, the regulations were laid before the Parliament on October the 25th and come into force on November the 19th. They do not respect the requirement that at least 28 days should elapse between the laying of an instrument which is subject to the negative procedure and the coming into force of that instrument. Uh, as regards its interest in the Scottish Government's decision to proceed in this manner, the Committee may wish to find the failure to comply with Section 28 to be acceptable in the circumstances. The reasons for doing so are outlined by the Scottish Government's Local Government and Communities Directorate in its letter to the presiding officer of October the 25th. Does the committee wish to draw the regulations to the attention of the Parliament on reporting ground J as they fail to comply with the requirements of section 28.2 of the Interpretation and Legislative Reform Scotland Act 2010? Yeah? Okay. Uh, Moving on to the next instruments on our agenda, no points have been raised by our legal advisers on SSI's 2017, 342, 343 and 344. Is the committee content with these instruments? Okay. I now move the committee into private session. <laughs>